That is not a testament to the resiliency of Portland, Oregon after the tremendous snowstorm we experienced. Uh, I don't know what is. I mean, look how much they've cleaned that up. Right? Yeah, really. Uh, everyone got out uh, with a broom and yeah. just sort of swept whole, it away. The whole city really came together. It was, it was amazing. Quite a magical thing. I think they'll make a movie about that someday. Hello, everyone. This is Digital Trends Live. This is our daily show here from Digital Trends, where we talk about the trending tech topics of the day. We bring you interviews. We bring you all kinds of things, all while broadcasting live. As I said, across all of our different platforms, we're on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, all of those and more. But it means we can take your comments and questions as we go through the day, so please drop those in there. Uh, shout out to Gregory, who is already commenting in there. <laughs> a few other people who are bringing us, you know, some wonderful greetings for today. So thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And uh, we will absolutely take those comments and questions throughout the show. Let's talk about what's on the docket today, though, coming up in a little bit. So we're here in Portland, Oregon. This is where one of our studios are. We also have our New York studio, where Julian Chokatu, our mobile editor, is going to hop on here in just a little bit. We'll kind of go back and forth, and he'll walk us through the new Motorola G7 phone. I know everybody is excited about uh, Motorola's new lineup and just Motorola being back again. I feel like they're kind of making a comeback right now. So uh, Julian's going to kind of walk through what we have for that and take a look and kind of take some comments and questions as we go through that. Then we are going to be joined by Kate Welch. Kate works for Wizards of the Coast. She's a designer for Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, a designer for Dungeons and Dragons. So Kate is gonna be joining us to talk about that and just talk about where Dungeons and Dragons is going from now, how they're incorporating some different you know, tech aspects into the game. If you have questions, now is the time to get those in as well for that. I'm Greg Nibbler and also joining me for that interview here in a bit will be none other than Matt Smith. Hello, hello Matt. Matt. <laughs> Matt's saying hello to the internet <laughs> once again. I must say that sweater looks marvelous on you. Yeah, you yeah. Know, uh, I thought it'd really stand out and be unique. Yeah, it, I mean, it really is. I've expressed never seen my anything personality like it. with this sweater. Yeah, you did. It, it sums up you perfectly. Matt, thank you for being in here with us though today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. So part of the start of the show, for everybody who watches, you know, and you can kind of see our lineup there, where we talk about what the number one trending tech topic that we've seen so far today. So every morning, we kind of go through and see what people are talking about the most. And right now, it seems to be this Google announcement. So... <clears throat> What's going on is that the uh, Wall Street Journal, David Pierce of the Wall Street Journal, was able to test this out, and so that's kind of spurring the, the news for the day. But it's about Google's new augmented reality walking guide feature that's going to be rolling out to Google Maps. So wherever you are, however you have Google Maps, eventually this is going to roll out to your, uh, to your uh, update when it happens. They said it's going to take a little bit, but what we've got is a look at how it's going to work. And so um, as you can see, it's laying over real-time information over an actual image as you're walking around. So you hold up your phone, you can see the actual street, that's a live shot, and then it'll overlay, like boom, there's a sandwich place. Boom, you need to go to this direction here. So you can actually see a real-time thing instead of looking at your map and then trying to match it up with what's going on in the world. I don't know why the fox is necessary, but nonetheless, there it is. Well, you know, you gotta add cute animals to everything. Cute justified. animals yeah. are, ne are necessary. Mm -hmm. But Matt, I wanna know what you think, and for everybody watching, like how do you feel about this feature? Is this something you think you would use? Are you excited about it? Or, or what, are, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think it's mostly um, pretty dumb. Uh, <laughs> All right, just cutting straight <laughs> to the chase, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's my general sense, yeah. Um, see, like, I don't really understand why you would want to walk around with your phone up like that. Really? I mean, uh, do you not ever take a look at your maps, like, as you're walking around? Sure, but it's kind of like this thing where it's like, hmm, okay. Yeah. Oh, I gotta go over that way. It's yeah. not like I'm walking around like, <laughs> oh, I, I can't actually see the world without my phone in front of, in front of me. <laughs> like, it would make, it makes more sense if you, if it was like the Google Glass sort of thing. Yeah. Which where, where it was already, Google yeah. Glass had its problems, but, um, right. you know, recently, um, we were talking about Julian, actually. He recently mm -hmm. looked at something called the Focals, which are uh, a, a, a better, you know, yeah. um, implementation of that. So, yeah, I, th I think that, that if it was in glasses, right. it makes where more it's sense. Just, yeah, if it's just you're walking around with your phone you. like this, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I mean, I feel like there's um, enough people that are already staring at their phones anyway. Wouldn't this be better? At least people are, like, looking up instead of down. I mean, I guess, I guess that that could be a point. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, maybe you would see the uh, the person you're about to walk into, but then again, there might be <laughs> a cute little 3D fox distracting you. That you're chasing then, the fox. <laughs> and that's then you how run the hackers are going to work. So. Uh. <laughs> all right, you you have some points there. I mean, I think I I like this idea, especially if you're traveling somewhere. You know, but you're traveling, you don't know where you're at. You can actually hold this up and just get an idea because. 
I mean, for me, I get frustrated sometimes looking at the map and then I'm like, okay, is it oriented correctly? Mm -hmm. Do I have to switch it yeah. around? Maybe I'm going the wrong way. Maybe this is just a me problem. But I mean, holding it up, other than looking ridiculous, um, you know, I think it can actually help out a lot of people. I think this could be a, a, a big benefit. I think that it, it's useful. It might be useful in the travel instance that you were talking about. Um, but I also think that uh, this is this kind of Google wanting us to. Yeah. They would really love for us to walk around with this all day. Because can you imagine all those ads that would be popping, you know, popping up in front of your That's eyes true. as you're walking around? <laughs> oh, there's an ad for that promoted restaurant. Oh, there's an ad for that store. Right. They would love that. I um, mean, that's gonna go. That's gonna be incorporated in any way. As uh, Sam Slaughter noting from Facebook, uh, chasing the fox is better than chasing the dragon. This is this is true, I, I suppose. It, it, in the end, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I suppose. Cue the doors theme. All right, so. Um, I mean, this is what they're saying. So this is, is going to roll out. Like, we are going to be seeing this. It's um, going to happen. Yeah. I, I'm excited for it. Matt thinks it's dumb. Polar opposites. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you think mm -hmm. in, the, in the live chat. Tell us what you think about this, whether you're, whether you're excited for it. I mean, yeah. it will. I think it will, if everybody starts incorporating it and everybody has their phones up, it will look like a Black Mirror episode. Oh, yeah. Everybody's going to have it. Like, yeah, it looks like everybody's <laughs> trying to film you. Um, but, uh, but that's where it is. Let's see. Maybe see where someone had a major flail. Okay, yeah. So just, everybody's kind of bringing in their different comments and questions on this. But you can check that out at Digital Trends. Let us know what you think. So the Google AR feature for Maps slowly going to be rolling out to a bunch of phones. And, uh, and let us Ooh. know if you would use them. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what the response is like. <laughs> Matt thinks you're dumb. All right, <laughs> let's, go, let's go on to some read them and weep uh, comments here. So this is a part of the show where we take a look at some of the comments and questions that have come through across our different platforms over the last little bit here. So since we do have so many different platforms where our videos go out, we read the comments on all of those. And uh, sometimes they do make us weep, sometimes they do not. Uh, so let's take a look here. Mostly weeping. Mostly weeping, mostly just crying <laughs> ourselves to sleep. Uh, James Lindbergh regarding this device uh, let's see, learns your pet's paws, oh, cleans your pet's paws, no more muddy paw prints. I think that's what that's trying to say. Uh, leans them. Uh, there is this amazing invention called a towel. It conforms to your hand, fits the shape of the object you need to clean, and it, get ready, wipes it clean. It's cost effective and doesn't require paying digital trends to Fitbit. I love how we're getting paid out of this for showcasing what it is. Well, I don't know what this device is. Um, yeah. But uh, it sounds like I would probably think it was kind of dumb too. Yeah. Oh, really? So, it's, so, I'm yeah, so what I'm imagining, what I'm imagining right now is like there's some sort of like little like robot like glove that you like put your yeah. pants paw. Is that what pod. this is? Pro probably. I mean, I'm guessing that too. I haven't actually seen this video myself. I think it's a good idea because I mean, if you have a dog that doesn't sit still, if you could actually just have them. Well, then you have to get them to actually put their paw in it. Yeah, maybe never mind. <laughs> might not work at all. Uh, the yeah, you know, you know, you know how pets love to just like stick their paws in things? Yeah. Like, you know, you put socks on a cat, they love it. It's yeah. not a problem at all. <laughs> it should make for some great videos, though. That's for sure. I mean, the YouTube, sure. once they cut all the clips together, <laughs> this is going to be a good solid five minute video mm -hmm. that people are going to get out of this. Well, I can kind of see it. Um, the digital trends pimping it part, uh, you know, clearly, yeah, it's. Cost effect, how much they had to pay for that. You know, you don't, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> there's some comments I'm not even going to read coming from our own staff. All right, <laughs> let's go. Let's go <laughs> to, to our next comment that we have here J John Cover regarding Fujifilm GFX 50s hands on review. <laughs> Good God, this guy is a smug wipe. Uh, too bad for him that Capture One just provided support for Fuji cameras. I guess more pros like these cameras than Joe Jones. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm not sure if this was for uh, Davin, I'm going to guess, uh, who, was, who does our, our photography reviews. Um, <laughs> smug. Smug is, smug is the word there. Uh, too bad for him that Capture One just provided support. Yeah, too bad for him. Yeah, too He's going to be tossing and turning tonight. Think about that one, yeah. Gavin. Jeez. God. I Capture One support. <laughs> uh, as a reviewer, uh, Matt, do you have any commentary on this? Just when people do have the personal comments on there. I don't know. I mean, it happens all the time. It's the internet. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you did say hello, internet, to begin with, so I guess we started it off. <laughs> I, knew, uh, I knew where I was. <laughs> thank you, thank you, John, for this wonderful comment. Uh, we will certainly address that with Davin. Maybe, actually, Davin will be on here next week. Maybe he'll address that with you. All right, Jim McLean, regarding Alta's eye in Battle Angel, it has over 100 times more detail than Gollum in Lord of the Ring. 
Okay, Alta, it's uh, the new uh, Battle Angels, the new movie that's coming out where it's, uh, she's supposed to be kind of an android. Oh creation. yeah, it's You weird. know, okay. Um, wait, are you trying to tell me that a movie made 18 years after Lord of the Rings has better graphics technology available to it? I think so. I think they are trying to tell you that, yeah. Jim nailed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really... You got it, Jim. You came through, you understood, you read through the really, you know, real layered commentary that we had there. Although, although to, to Jim's point, you know, um, it is kind of interesting because I would not say that uh, Battle Angel actually looks better than Gollum. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the, I've seen the commercials. It's not looking <laughs> it doesn't great look to me, as good. Yeah. So... So maybe, maybe Jim, maybe yeah. you're a little bit off. I don't know. I don't know where we go with that. Jim, thank you for the, your biting commentary. We will go through and continue on with Read em and Weep. Surely today, surely day, uh, regarding how 5G will change <laughs> your smartphone <laughs> and your life in 2019. 5G will kill you so you won't be able to drive. I'm good. Pass. Okay. Um, there's a lot to un unbag there. Now, I will say, mm. man, I don't know if you've seen as much as the 5G commentary that's come through in the comments. It's definitely a, a hot button issue for a lot of people. Yeah, the conspiracy as, theories I think are out in force. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty intense. Um, does that say how 5B will change? I think we might have had just something in there. Um, but but Matt, let me ask you, what are your thoughts on 5G when it comes down to conspiracy theories? How do you feel about Shirley's commentary here? Uh, I think the conspiracies about it are pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> that's three dumbs. Yeah, three dumbs kicking off Monday. I don't, I, I mean, like, we already went through this, right? Uh, we yeah. went through this, like, every time a new wireless thing. Like, there was so much time spent trying to convince people that Wi-Fi yeah. wasn't going to, you know, kill right. them. Right, yes, absolutely. Um, because reasons. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's where we're at with the 5G, so, so Here surely, we are again. So, yeah, don't worry about driving. <laughs> it's going to kill you. Cool. Well, have fun while you can. So Sheldon Sugar, regarding Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, accuses oh. Nash of, <laughs> of blackmail. Nude photo scandal. Does anyone really want to see Jeff Bezos naked? Who's driving this? Me? <laughs> there is a there is a uh, thriving community of Jeff Bezos fanfic out there. I'm really? sure. I mean, have you seen this? No, I haven't. But okay, I'm sure, but you I'm got, sure I there, there is. is. I, I'm, someone else can Google it for me. Let me yeah. know how it goes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure there is. Yeah. That they're, oh yeah, that especially they're walking around with like that vest on and stuff these days. Yeah, there's some people that are like, mm, okay. he knows what he's doing, <laughs> Jeff Bezos. All right, well, that's I can understand uh, where you're going there as far as who's driving it. I don't know. I don't know. It just kind of happens every day. No, so. Yeah, no one's driving it. No one's driving it. That's, that's the problem. that's how this happens. We're all in the backseat later. <laughs> yep, <laughs> we're just seeing where it takes us. All right, let's continue on with some more tech talk. So some of the more trending stories that are coming out today. Samsung's Unpacked event is coming up on February 20th. That's next week. So it's coming up very soon. Where finally we're going to see at least the S10s are going to be unveiled. We knew that, but now we have. Uh, this, we've got a new teaser video from Samsung. It was just released today, and it's a little, uh, they, they pretty much spell out what they're going to do. I mean, the, the, uh, how it looks is, is a little bit confusing, but essentially it's the foldable phone is going to be unveiled. The future unfolds, that kind of spells it out, on uh, February 20th, so that we're going to finally see, most likely, some kind of announcement about the foldable phone. Matt, the standard question I have is, do you want a foldable phone? Uh, maybe, maybe. I, I can yep. see it maybe working out. Um, I guess it, it really depends on like what the whole foldable part yep. of it looks like because we've already seen foldable phones in the past. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of concepts that never you know, were ready for prime time. Yep. A lot of those had sort of the problem where when you talk about foldable, it's like, oh, there's a hinge and then like, you know, like there's a seam in between. Yeah. Now, obviously, what they're showing, it doesn't look like there's any steam. They're, they're probably really wanting to go for the full-on foldable um, approach, uh, which I think could be really cool. Yeah. Um, is it something that you would use? Like, if you set aside what the... Because the possible price is going to be big. I mean, we've seen rumors everywhere yeah, up to, like, $2,500 for this phone. and that's phone. where it gets a little dicey. So, ignoring price, if you just put, take the price out of it, is this something that you would find a normal use for? I mean, if it was just going to be part of my phone anyway, I would probably mm -hmm. like it. I don't know if I would go out of my way to buy a foldable phone. Yeah. Um, I do wonder a little bit about, like, what this looks like, because the question is, like, do you fold it so that, like, the screens are going to be on the outside? I or do you fold it so the screens are on the inside? Well, I think well, and that's that's a good point, because we saw the Royal phone, and theirs was on the outside, the screen yeah. was on the outside, which seems like it would scratch really easy. Right. Just to be, mm -hmm. be blatant. I mean, the, the some of the renderings we've seen with Samsung looks like what it does is it folds inside, so the two 
the, okay. the large screen folds together, and then on the outside, there's a third screen as well. So you have okay. a third screen that looks kind of like a normal phone, then you open it up, and then you get the unfolded double. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that working. Um, Part of what they're talking about is a gaming aspect to it. That this would be they're uh, developing new software for gaming. Yeah, I don't know about that. Okay, that's that's kind of what. See, I wanted here's to the problem. This is on one of those things. Like, whenever someone comes out and is like, "We have this new thing. It's going to be great for gaming. It's something totally unlike something before." Problem is, gamers have to actually make games for it. You can't just get like a foldable phone and then fire <laughs> up a game and all of a sudden it's going to be perfectly scaled to that screen. Yeah, you it's would not have going to work that way. So like. You'd have, it, it would be like years probably before you got games that really made use of it. That actually, yeah, you could take advantage of with that. Like, yeah, hey, you guys like games, don't you? There you go. But I mean, like, you know, a bigger screen is a bigger screen, so I can I can see that being useful for gaming potentially. I would like it better for, uh, it, you know, what it could really be a threat for is tablets. Yeah. Which are already kind of struggling, and then if you had like a foldable phone that you could fold out to be, you know, the size of like almost an iPad Mini. Mm -hmm. Then why would you need a tablet? Would that so that would be something that you would be interested in? I mean, and coming from the computer, I mean, I you're the computing tablet. editor. Like, <laughs> you know, what's that? I don't. I don't own a like an iPad. You don't have a but, tablet. Uh, Are they I, down um, also? Yeah. So, but you know, I kind of want one sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> And that would, an affordable phone could completely, uh, you know, get rid of that one. Well, that's the announcement. So Samsung posting that teaser video, basically saying they're going to unveil something about the foldable phone at their Unpacked event on February 20th. So stay tuned for that. We've got the video up at Digital Trends. You can take a look there and just kind of walk through all the rumors we've heard about it, what we think we know about it. We still don't even have a name. They said either Galaxy, the, the rumors are either Galaxy X the or Galaxy phone. F. Uh, yeah, Galaxy F for foldable, which seems kind of cheesy to me. But, uh, the no, F no. Galaxy S. The F, F Galaxy S10. X. Yeah. Nine. Ten. Yeah, come on, Samsung, hire us. Niner. Niner in there product. somewhere. All right, so all that is going on. You can check that out at digitaltrends.com. All right, so let's go to one other uh, story here that I had today. Uh, at least we've got time for a couple more, maybe. And this has to do with SpaceX. SpaceX in the news, Elon Musk. Um, so SpaceX has officially filed for an FCC request for 1 million Earth stations as part of their Starlink internet system. So in case you don't know, just to kind of bring you up to speed on that. So uh, SpaceX has had this plan for a while to launch. It's over, I believe, 12,000 satellites is what they're going to be launching. There's this video here that kind of showcases it. This is from Mark Hanley from the University College of London, kind of pieced together just some images and, and some different uh, pictures of what that would look like. So the mesh of these satellites would cover the globe, being able to beam internet essentially anywhere on Earth is, is what, they, what the goal is. Yeah. Now, the Earthlink stations, or the Earth stations, as I don't know if that's the official term, but that's what it's kind of basically called. Uh, they want one million of those, so that would those would be the receivers on the ground for the Starlink yeah. internet system, saying that possibly this could be launched by uh, by 2020. You could start seeing some of this. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Now, how do you feel about the 12,000 satellites up there? That's fine. Okay. There's probably a lot more than that right now. So. There are more than that. I mean, 12,000 <laughs> 12, satellites seems like an awful lot that you would have to maintain. Oh, and yeah, well, sure. Of that. I mean, like, anything I mean, that Elon Musk junk. does is kind of, like, you know, logistically maybe a little crazy, but, you know, that's why yeah. people love the guy. He's just, it's like, I'm going to go do nutso thing, and then he does it. Yeah. Um, I, but, yeah, being able to get the internet anywhere, like, obviously that could be really cool, especially, you know, if you could do this on, on you know, if you could get this on your phone or something. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of places in the world that don't have internet uh, or don't have good internet. Yeah. So... Um, I mean, even in the United States, you go out into, you know, like, you drive 100 miles out in the, to mountains in Oregon. Yep. And you are probably completely disconnected from the world. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, even where, where I grew up, which isn't that far away, there is no cable run out there. I mean, you have to have satellite internet. That's the yeah. only way you can get any. Yeah. And, and right now, satellite internet really sucks, generally. Uh, it tends to be pretty, it, it tends to be okay speeds. Mm -hmm. But then there's a lot of latency issues with satellite internet. There are. Um, and so um, a better system would, would definitely be welcome. Well, possibly this could be out by, by 2020. And I will say uh, to Elon Musk, since we did see that you liked one of our tweets over the weekend, uh, thank you, Elon Musk, please, <laughs> you are always welcome to come on the show and talk about Starlink. We would love that if you had the time. I can probably work you in. We'll get your people on here. We'll figure out a schedule that would work, but we'll see if we can squeeze it. Talk about Elon Starlink. Um, we we promise we won't ambush you with any joints. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, joy free. Unless, hey, if you we're in we're in Oregon, it's perfectly legal. Oh, here. That is, I don't care. That's yeah, true. we'll figure that, that out. If that's what you want, we'll we'll make that happen. All right, Elon Musk, join us on the show. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one more one more story. Just want to make sure that my producers, uh, we're going doing one more. So this is just something briefly I want to bring up, and it has to do with the possibility of a Star Trek replicator being reality. And uh, so it's this is a new kind of three D printing and the 3D printing method called computed axial lithography. But essentially what it is with this, normal 3D printers, you see it, it's printed, it raises up whatever mm -hmm. is you know, layer by layer. This goes a different way. It takes this resin, and instead of building that out, it carves into that. This is you know, just really dumbing it down, essentially. But yeah, that's, that's basically what it's doing. So it's using laser to etch into that, and thereby it can create uh, whatever it is that it's doing, you know, whatever it's wanting to create really actually a lot faster and it gives it a lot of a lot of different depth as far as what it can do yeah that seems really cool i mean um 3d printers are a technology that we ah oh, geez how long has it been now like when were 3d printers like the hot new thing like it's probably like six or seven years ago now yeah you know and uh they kind of struggled um to get got a little stagnant. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it's because the, uh, I, I think anyways, because of that fundamental technology of like printing out the plastic mm -hmm. um, is actually not that hot. Like it's pretty slow. Yeah. Well, actually it is hot. <laughs> so you yeah. have this like really hot plastic like going right. all over the place. Uh, it tends to be slow, tends to have problems with detail. Um, so a different approach could be useful. Um, I don't know exactly, you know, how, how easy this would be to do at the home, um, but uh, you know, something that's great for 3D printers like this are great for, though, are uh, Dungeons & Dragons miniatures. Ah, oh, look uh, at that. And, and that is actually a common problem with uh, a lot of 3D printers today is that they aren't um, detailed enough. Like, yeah. you saw this thing, it's, like, really smooth, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you want. Like, if you have, like, some little thing you're trying to print out, you want it to be able to resolve a lot of detail. But yeah. In most 3D printers today, what you end up with is like these little lines all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, your person's sword will be layers. sticking out and it'll have like these little etchings like each layer of the sword. If yeah. you can even do that because like something that thin, Right, that can be a, really A lot hard. of 3D printers can't handle that. They'll well, break. With, with this, the way it spins around and it's got the 3D pattern of, of light that's, that's and putting this into it, I guess you can get into extreme detail yeah. on this. So it'll be neat to see where this goes. You can check that out at digitaltrends.com. Let us know what you think. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I think we're going to a break here really quick, and then we're going to be joined by Kate Welch. Kate Welch, to talk about Dungeons & Dragons. Matt's staying right here with me. I'm Greg Nibbler. Uh, oh, one more comment. If I have to wear a lab coat and gloves, it's not even close to being ready. Okay. Well, Keelan, you're just taking all the You're just not very adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break. Back here in just a minute with Kate Welch right here on Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Thank you, everyone, for joining us broadcasting live every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, talking to you across all kinds of different platforms, which means we can take your comments and questions as we go through the show. So drop those in there. No matter when you're seeing those videos, drop those in, and we'll make sure to get back to those. And I'm Greg Nibbler, here with Matt Smith once again, and we have a wonderful guest who's joining us right now. We have 
Kate Welch from Wizards of the Coast, game designer for Dungeons and Dragons. Hello, Kate. Hi, how are you guys? Doing great. Thank you so much for hopping on here today. We have so many things to ask you, and I know there's been some questions coming in already for you, uh, but I wanted to start off, you know, just kind of talking to you about, you know, it's been a little little bit now that you've been working for uh, Dungeons and Dragons with this, but you come from the video game industry, like a it's totally true. different kind of background. How has that transition been into this kind of game? Um, it's been a very steep learning curve, I will tell you. Um, one of the, I think one of the best stories that I have about it is there was a point where uh, we wanted to completely change the mechanics and story of, a, of an upcoming product that we're working on, and I was like, oh my god, this is gonna, this is gonna push our schedule back so much. And my boss was like, no, it'll take, it'll take two weeks to write this, and then we're, we're fine. And I was like, that is not possible. <laughs> In the video game industry, this is a six month delay at least. Um, so that I think has been the, the uh, agility of being able to make sweeping changes when um, your medium is just the written word has been, <laughs> been pretty uh, educational. That does help. That helps out a lot. Well, uh, Matt, I know you have a lot of questions as well for. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to um, start off talking about uh, you know the tech a little bit because uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, one of the, the really cool things that's been happening um, is the new D&D uh, &D Beyond. I mean, at this point, it's not really that new, I suppose. Right. But um, it's, it's a, a, I don't know how to describe it exactly, like a, a whole digital rollout of all the, the rule books. You can get an app. I have an app on my phone. And when I open up the app, it's got all this cool stuff. Um, I was wondering, like, what's, what are players you know, saying about that? How are they responding to that? Have you seen a lot of engagement uh on that? Certainly, when I was playing, uh, I think I started on fourth edition. The D and D Beyond was starting up around then, um, and I, it was invaluable even back then. But now they've added all kinds of new uh, functionality. You can get a very robust interactive character sheet. So it's gotten to the point where, on my live play game, Acquisitions Incorporated, the C team, um, we always use our D and D Beyond character sheets now, whether it's a live show or or in the studio. Um, it's, it has proved to be really, really useful. I always end up sounding like an ad for D and D beyond, which <laughs> I, I don't mean to, but it's, it's a really cool service. It's not even, it's not owned by Wizards of the Coast. It's, um, it's actually owned by Curse Media. So they, they're a partner with us. Um, so it's, but it's, it's just, it's such a good, such a good service. Really, really popular. And I actually didn't know that about the character sheet. So you can actually put your whole character sheet on the app and just, Instead of erasing through like the hit point marker on your uh, exactly. character sheet, you can actually just you know type in the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that sounds a lot more useful. It's I, pretty useful, yeah. Does does that change um, in any way like how um, you're designing for the game? Is there any like different considerations when you have an app like that out there? Um, we always want to make sure that what we're doing is updated as soon as possible in D and D Beyond, which is like I said, since they're a partner. Um, they are, they're, they're not always in sync perfectly with us, but we're getting better about that, making sure that whatever, whatever it is we're updating in, in, uh, the, the book is getting up to date in, in the D and D beyond database as well. But they've been, they're wonderful partners. They do all kinds of digital content with us. They come over and do interviews and they host awesome live stream events. They did a, they, my very first dungeon mastering live before an audience anyway, <laughs> was at PAX Unplugged, I believe it was, um, in Philly last year. And they it was a D&D Beyond show where they use the D&D Beyond um, functionality. There's a randomize button. If you want to create a character, you can just hit randomize. It'll randomize every single stat, and you'll get utter nonsense. So everybody <laughs> had done that. They had hit the randomize button, and I, I DM'd a game for them. And it was, uh, it was hot garbage <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> nice <laughs> i uh i think i'm learning that i need to uh dive a little bit even deeper into that app because although i've been using it there's apparently a lot of things about it that i didn't even know yeah um, they're, they're always updating it and um so you in the video game background you were working on guild wars 2 for quite yes. some time is that right yeah okay. And did you, when you were making that transition, you already spoke about, you know, the, the timetables of, like, pushing out a, an update or a change. Is there anything else, like, making that transition between those two industries that has really struck you? Because I think a lot of people would think that they're very similar, but is that true? 
Um, they, they're similar in certain ways, for sure. They're both the RPGs. So you have, you know, a bunch of all of us at, at uh, the D&D office, we're always talking about video games that we're playing, which is very similar to working at a game studio, a video game studio. Um, I will say the D&D team is quite a lot smaller than mm. one might expect. Um, it's only maybe 20, 25 people. And that, that's counting all the art directors and the, the graphic designers and, and everything, too. Um, and so it's, it's a, I hate this word, but it feels a lot scruffier, you know? Um, and <laughs> yeah. so we're able to, I think, turn on a dime quite a, quite a bit faster. Um, but I also think that in the space that we're in, there is room to be braver than there is in, um, in video games. And what I mean by that is, uh, I don't know, because it's a smaller team and because we are, a, a very diverse body of people uh, as far as religion and and uh, sexual and gender identity and um, we we have the ability to kind of push a little bit more of what we want to do as uh, as our social agenda on on D and D, which essentially just means making D and D as inclusive and welcoming as possible. I think we're able to make those changes a lot faster than the video game industry is, which is probably a longer conversation. But right, <laughs> but it. It's it's an interesting thing to see. There's there's a um, the the video game industry is so robust, it's so so um, expensive, I guess. And and when you're think when you're sticking that much money into you know millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into a product, I think you're less likely to take risks. Um, whereas I think that D and D is able to do those things and take those risks, and it's it's been paying off because fifth edition has been the most successful edition of D and D to date. So that I think it's a good thing. I think it's, it's pretty cool. Um, probably what, what you were saying earlier too, just that quicker turnaround time so you can make adjustments on the fly. Like if you, you know, and with a close knit team, that's really cool that you have people yeah. of su such diversity that you yes. can have everybody mm -hmm. pulling in a different direction and see where you want to go, just different ideas. Oh, um, yes. That sounds, sounds like it's a lot of fun. It's, it sounds <laughs> like it's a lot more, uh, a lot more flexible. Like uh, yeah. something that strikes me with, with like a computer game is that when you're playing a computer game, you are you get whatever is there, right? Like, you can't interpret it a different way, really. Um, but something like Dungeons and Dragons, it's a little bit more of a give and take between you and the fans, and and even there at the table between the dungeon master, you know, and the players that kind of mold that experience. So yeah. I think I think yeah. it's a an interesting an interesting difference between those two, even though they might look very similar on the surface. Well, speaking yeah. of fans, we do have some questions coming through for you too. Okay. Uh, I just want to say, eat, drink, roll. Just ask. Can you ask Kate if she knows if there's a date for the new Acquisitions Incorporated source book? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know the exact date, and um, I think that's probably a Penny Arcade announcement that you should watch their Twitter for. But, <laughs> uh, but I do know that it's it's due to be this year. Okay, Can you tell us anything more about the source book? Because I I, uh, I knew that was coming up. I was going to ask you, you know, if you could provide a little insight into that. Um, I know that they've been working on it forever. I know that the names, the people that they have editing and writing and doing art for it, are all the same people that you have grown to love for their work on Fifth Edition. They've they've uh, worked with those same people. Alyssa Grant, who is the um, the brand manager and the head honcho of all the Acquisitions Incorporated stuff, worked at Wizards of the Coast for about a year. So she made those those uh, inroads, and she so it's it's. Extremely high quality. I've heard some of the art directors. I'm not working on it directly, um, but the art directors on D and D are reviewing the the um, galleys as they're coming in, and they are. I keep hearing things like, "Wow, this looks really good." Ooh, <laughs> I really like what they did here, and that's a very good thing to hear in the D and D team. So I think it's going to be a very cool book. Uh, how do you think that tech do you think is going to be incorporated more with D and D going forward? Are there any plans to to incorporate something more in it? I mean, now that the app is so successful, like any other ideas with it? Oh man! So when it comes to apps and and particularly stuff like D and D Beyond, we tend to work with partners. So for first party application stuff, I don't know if anything's in the works. But I'm I'm the kind of person who always tries to solve problems by inventing apps in my head. Um, <laughs> and one of the one of the things I I just love the idea of, and this is just a freebie because I'm clearly not going to make it. Somebody out there go make this. Is um, the idea of essentially like a Tinder app, but 
for finding people to play Dungeons and Dragons with. <laughs> That's pretty so, great. That's a good idea. Yeah. Right. I know. And, and you put like what kind of class you want to play, how experienced you are, whether you want to do theater of the mind or combat or whatever. Like you want to, you you can set all these parameters, and then there's a matching algorithm finds you people to play either online or in person. And because that's the hardest thing to do is to actually find a group. There's so many people who are who are D and D curious, but um, but can't actually find people to play. Yeah, I'm actually that's a problem that I'm having right now. Is uh, I have a second group um, that is somewhat spotty sometimes, and um, it would be really good to have uh, you know an, an app to like find a, another player or something. You know, uh, be able to bring in more people. So, uh, but it is it is kind of tough to find people sometimes. You know. Well, okay, there's the million dollar idea. So somebody mm -hmm. out there, there you know, go. just got yeah. a big idea <laughs> and that uh, they need to take advantage of. Plus, can you imagine like the PR releases for that? Like <laughs> people would cover I that know. app so hard. Oh yeah. yeah. Boom, coverage right here. All right, well, um, Kate, I want to say thanks, too, so much for joining us. Uh, what can you tell us, like, where can people follow you on Twitch? Like, how, uh, what, what do you think um, is the best way for people to watch you on there? Oh, on Twitch, uh, well, I'm streaming a video game run of uh, currently Baldur's Gate 1 on Thursdays from four, for 3 to 5, 3 to 5. And that is on the D&D the &D Twitch, twitch.tv slash D&D. Um, and then come watch the C-Team Wednesdays uh, 4 to 6.37, um, it, which is at twitch.tv slash Penny Arcade. Fantastic. Matt, any final questions? I didn't want to, I know you have a lot. Oh no, uh, I, I think I'm good. Uh, I was, the only other thing I was going to ask is if there's uh, any, you know, insight you can provide on what your next project is. Ooh, well, I, I, uh, I don't want to say too much. There I know, I think there's a, a secretive one going on. There's so much stuff going on. <laughs> I will say that uh, you, sh you guys should start hearing more about our big adventure book this year, which we have, we've been keeping ultra secret, um, but I think it's going to be a hell of a thing. Awesome. <laughs> hell of a thing is a good enough tease right is that, there. Is that going to be the title? <laughs> oh, wish. <laughs> <Hell of> <laughs> <laughs> well, Kate, thank you so much for taking some time to hop here on Digital Trends Live and talk about this. It's really exciting. Everybody, follow Kate wherever wherever you're at. Hit follow on her. Watch the stream. Watch everything. And looking forward to seeing what's next. Kate, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Matt, thank you for being in here as well. Yeah, no problem. Well, I, see that, I will admit, D &D. I have not played a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, so <laughs> your guidance was helpful in that. But I am I'm definitely D&D curious, as you were saying. Okay, well, you know, we gotta get a game together. Maybe we need a digital then. trends team. Yeah, all right. For sure. Does that just mean I'm just gonna get killed right away or something? I'm imagining. No, right. no, I know how it works. Uh, we never do something like okay. that. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everybody for tuning in. So, this is Digital Trends Live. We are live and we've got more coming up. So, what's gonna happen is we're gonna take a quick break and then we're going to head to our New York studio. I'm here in Portland and we're gonna go back and forth with Julian Chocatu to talk about Motorola, the G7 phones, that whole new line that's out. He's gonna give us a rundown on what they released, what it looks like, when we're going to see them, what the features are. So we're going to talk all about that, all while broadcasting live. Drop in your comments and questions. And uh, as Keelan just said, Matt totally saved Greg's D&D &D bacon. Um, so <laughs> thank you, everybody, for doing it. That's why we want everybody live here. So joining us. And uh, let's take a break. We'll be back here in a minute with more DT Live.
Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. Thank you everyone for joining. So that was a lot of fun, our last segment there, having everybody drop in their comments. Sorry I didn't get to some of those, but go ahead and leave those on the video afterward and then we'll, we'll try to make sure that we get into those. Uh, I'm Greg Nibbler, so here in just a couple of minutes, we're gonna be heading to our New York studio to bring on Julian Chikatu to talk about the new Motorola G7s. But while we're getting that hooked up, I wanna go back through to uh, another tech headline that we didn't get a chance to go to because uh, since we're live, it's always fun to get a spot on opinions, like what people's opinions are, and that's you who are watching us. And so the story I had had to do with Spotify. So a lot of us out there are probably Spotify subscribers. I know some people are Apple Music. There's there's still some maybe Pandora only people out there, uh, but Spotify by and large, at least as far as what I know from from the people that I interact with, is the one that we go to. And Spotify, if you're on the free service, had an update that rolled out last week. So you got an email probably, and you, it's one of those emails where it's like, okay, update to end user agreement, and usually you just kind of go through it. Well, Spotify now has uh, said something in that, and they, they're telling you that they may terminate or suspend your account if you use an ad blocker. So this was the update that rolled out on Thursday, February 7th. And so bringing this up to everyone, you know, obviously we all get annoyed with ads, but ads are necessary when you have a free service or it's just something we've all got to get used to. But do you use an ad blocker to, to block ads when you're using Spotify? I mean, you don't have to, I guess, admit it, maybe. Maybe just say a friend does if you want to in the chat, not to call yourself out. But it's something that I feel like ad blockers are so popular right now. There's a lot of us that incorporate them in. And if this idea of companies banning or suspending your account for using ad blockers is, becomes uh, prominent, how is that going to change how we interact on the web? Will you go to a pay service? Like if, if a company you use incorporated that in, would that make you want to go then to the subscription-based service so that you didn't have to deal with that? That's something to, something to think about, and I'm, I just want to know, you know what you think of that as we go through. So I'm going to pull up some of the comments as we go through here, and we're just waiting to get Julian on the line as well for our New York side. Uh, so, so yeah, let us know what you think and, uh, and where you think that's going to go because I, I'm curious. I, for me, I don't know if it would make me subscribe or not, but I also don't use an ad blocker. I also use the service because I just get, uh, get done with the ads anyway. So let us know what you think, just kind of going through some of the tech headlines for that. All right, let's get back to talking about some mobile technology here at Digital Trends. So we have our expert on from New York. It is Julian Chukatu. Julian, hello. Let's see if Julian can hear us. Oh, I'm not sure if hey, he can hear us right now. Okay, good. He can't hear us. So we're going we're gonna to walk through this. I'm just going to let everybody know who's watching live. So I'm here in Portland. Julian's in New York. If there's a little bit of a delay, that happens sometimes. But we're going to have Julian walk us through all of the new Motorola announcements. So Julian, let's start it off here. What has Motorola announced? So they kind of usually do this at MWC, but this year I guess they decided to jump the gun a little bit. Uh, does that mean that they're going to launch something else at MWC? We don't know, uh, hopefully, but at the moment, again, we don't know. But So what they did announce last week on Thursday is there, there are new Motorola G7 phones. So G7 is their sort of budget series phones that are kind of popular, actually. They uh, are really well-made phones that you can get uh, a lot of cool features for, uh, a solid price tag. So this year there's the G7, which is the sort of flagship of the of the three budget phones. There's the G7 Power and then the G7 Play. Now they traditionally have a G7 Plus, but apparently this is not coming to the US, so that's going to be available internationally. So technically four phones, but in the US we're only going to see three of those. So the G7 is basically the uh, flagship budget phone that they're announcing this year, and it kind of doesn't really look like a budget phone. When you look at it, when you hold it, it kind of feels really substantial. Uh, it's $300 in the US. Uh, they're all coming out in the spring, by the way. Uh, the G7 is going to start at $300. It has more or less everything you really want from uh, a phone at this price range. You have a pretty solid dual camera setup. You have a uh, you know high-res 1080p uh, screen. You have a 
fairly you know decent sized battery it's 3000 milliamp power it should get you through most of that day um, and you know overall you're getting that feel of that bezel-less edge-to-edge screen that you're seeing in a lot of these expensive phones so what basically we're seeing with the G7 range and a lot of other bunch of phones is uh, a lot of these flagship looks and features are trickling down into these cheaper phones so at a much more faster rate so you're getting a lot more access to these features at a, at a more affordable price point so that's the G7 pretty standard uh, good looking budget phone it's I think the G7 Power is a little more interesting. It's uh, $250, 249 technically. Um, but the cool thing about this one is it has a 5,000 milliamp powered battery in there. And they're saying it can go up to three days, I believe. Uh, that's their claim. We'll obviously have to test it. But for very similar performance, oh, actually exactly the same performance as the Moto G7, they're all running a Snapdragon 600 series chip. Um, you're getting the same performance through all, all of those phones, but this one can go on for three days. So that's like pretty good performance, um, pretty overall decent camera specs. Uh, everything else is pretty close to stock Android, so there's not a ton of bloatware. Um, this will depend on where you buy it from, but also uh, you're getting very smart Motorola gestures that we've known and loved from over the years. For example, you can double uh, chop all of those phones to turn on the flashlight. You can double twist it to turn on the camera. So you're getting all of that, but a pretty slim interface. So everything that we want in a lean, mean uh, budget phone. Uh, but that 5,000 milliamp hour battery is really the sort of selling point of that phone. And I think it's kind of like the takeaway of all of those phones is that um, that's the one that you might want to get if battery life is such a crucial uh, factor in your smartphone buying purchase. And then there's the G7 Play, which is the cheapest of the lot. It's 200. Um, it is the same exact processor, so you're getting similar power, less RAM, and in general, it kind of feels and looks cheaper. Um, but for $200, you know, I feel like that's one of the best you can buy. buy. Yeah, I was going to say for that price range too. I mean, how does that compare to like say say a Samsung, you know, I, I think it's the J series or whatever their their lower end series is. Like how would you say these Motorola's compare to say Samsung, LG, the other ones in that same price range? So we haven't had a chance to look too much at Samsung's budget range or their mid-range phones because Samsung is very shy about showing that kind of stuff off. They, they only really want you to see the S series because that's what they really want to sell. Um, but f basically, these are definitely going to be the better buys. Samsung's try Samsung tends to sort of overprice their budget phones a little bit. Um, they might not have as many of the features at a high and higher, slightly higher price. So I think often the Motorola sort series has been our go-to for recommending um, budget phones. But uh, we have been seeing over the past year and a half, um, HMD Global, who makes Nokia phones now, they're coming in strong and they're trying to target this exact same demographic. A lot of the phones that they're bringing to the U.S. are under $200, under $300. So um, they're really going for that same market and they are doing a pretty damn good job. For example, we looked at the Nokia 7.1 a couple months back and I think that still is our best uh, budget phone at $350. So slightly more expensive, but I think it's worth shelling out a little extra money for that phone because you get slightly better um, features and a better build quality and all of that. So it's kind of cool that there's this race to, there's finally even more competition in this space because now Motorola has to play out a little more, has to fight for this position a little more as HMD is kind of creeping in, which means that we're all going to get even better phones, hopefully. Um, that's sort of the cool part. And uh, hopefully more, more of these carriers or more of these companies will come in and try to innovate even more in this budget space so that we can all get better phones and don't have to pay as much because, as we all know, smartphones are getting way too expensive. Uh, oftentimes, you're paying $1,000 for one today. Yeah, that's that's I think a really important point because that that price range, you know, that's great if you want to go in at that and you want to get the thousand dollar phone. But for a lot of us, I mean, uh, we want to pay a little bit less uh, than that. And so it's it's nice to see some of these features, you know, finally rolling down to that budget level to where we're going to get some of those incorporated in there. Um, with MWC coming up, not that right. we want to go too much into that, uh, but how uh, do you think we're going to see more of these at that? And then I'm going to have to ask you about the foldable phone as well here in a second, uh, just because we got the news today. But um, what do you what do you think we're going to see at MWC when it comes to this this range, or is it going to be mostly the high end phones? Uh, 
Uh, so I think for the most part, I, I assume HMD might, like as, as usual as it does, might show off some other budget phones. But I think that the focus at MWC is going to be on those higher end phones. There's going to be tentpole phones for a lot of these companies. And then I'm sure they will have sub uh, more budget phones that they're also going to announce. But, you know, everyone, all eyes are really going to be on those flagship phones at the show, um, which I feel like is always the case in that some of the budget phones come a little after uh, the show so that they can, they don't see the limelight of those flagship phones. Uh, one thing I did want to touch on the uh, Motorola range is that um, there is one sort of disappointing thing that I mentioned in our hands-on uh, review of all of them is that there is no NFC in any of those phones. And um, so... NFC is what you use for contactless payments. You know, Apple Pay uses NFC, Google Pay uses NFC, and it's a growing thing in the US, especially where people are using their phones to pay at stores or uh, just all sorts of places, basically. So I feel like uh, HMD had NFC in a phone that we're looking at right now called the Nokia 6.1, and that's $160. I feel like Motorola should have added NFC into all of these phones because while not everyone might say we use uh, Google Pay to pay at Walgreens or something like that, it's something that you can do. It's something that every other uh, phone manufacturer in this price range is basically doing. And it's, I feel like it's just something nice to have as an additional benefit in that, say, this has actually happened to me, I left my wallet. And uh, suddenly I'm like, oh, how do I pay for this? Uh, do I have to go home? Or no, nope, I can pay with my phone. So that's something that I think is a pretty neat feature that they should have added. And only my, my only gripe with uh, these phones. Yeah, I would say that's a strange thing to leave out to me. NFC doesn't seem like that would be that big of a deal to put that into a phone since I mean, a lot of lower end phones have that already. It doesn't seem like that should be something that's that's a huge deal breaker. It's like, nah, we're not going to put that in. Save, I don't know what you would save on that from a company standpoint. Um, let me ask you this, just a kind of final question. You're just talking about going forward, unless you have something else you want to contribute. Uh, going forward with uh, Samsung Unpacked, just to kind of briefly talk about that because it was in the news. We have you here on the line. You're a mobile editor. I have to ask, uh, did you see the foldable teaser? Do you think we're going to get a foldable phone from Samsung Unpacked next week? Um, I, I really, this is one that I really don't know. The, the, uh, the leaks are at an all time high for not just the foldable phone, but for the Galaxy S10. Um, the S10 is for sure going to be there. I think this is a commemorative event for their 10th annual, uh, their 10th phone, basically the S10. You know, it's a huge deal in that series, which has been immensely popular for the mainstream consumer. Um, will they announce the foldable phone at this event? I feel like they shouldn't because um, we have an op-ed that went up on D Digital Trends a couple uh, weeks ago where um, one of our writers said that announcing, say, there's supposed to be three or four variations of the Galaxy S10 and announcing a foldable phone as well, I feel like would just detract from that uh, commemorative experience of the Galaxy S10. So uh, I don't think they really should because one, for our sake, we don't have to go crazy covering all of those phones. But also I feel like it would detract from one or the other. Everyone's only going to talk about that foldable phone or everyone's only going to talk about the Galaxy S10. And I feel like the foldable phone is such a special thing from Samsung. We know it's going to come first half of this year. I feel like they should maybe take their own time to do a separate event where we can just all in about that foldable phone because there's a lot to sort of learn about and people want to experience it, spend more time with it. And I feel like throwing it in with the Galaxy S10 might sort of detract from it or might detract from the S10 series as well. So um, I don't know. So if we see it uh, next week, then that'll be uh, a very, very busy day for me. Uh, but if we don't, uh, then uh, I will be relieved. But also, um, we can expect it at definitely first half of 2019. Fantastic. Julian, thank you so much for having me here. And like Julian said, you know, all these articles are at digitaltrends.com. You can take a look. The leaks are at an all-time high for that. But it's great to know about the Motorola line and just to see where they're going, see some expansion into that space of more budget phones and uh, to see where we all end up with that. So, Julian, thank you so much for, for joining us here for Digital Trends Live today. And... Thank you to everybody who is watching right now. So this is our daily show here from Digital Trends. We broadcast live at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, every day. 
bringing you tech headlines, bringing you interviews, bringing you uh, news, and bringing you interactivity. We're broadcasting live, which means we can talk to you directly, and we really do appreciate that. Anybody who is hopping in there, I want you to hit subscribe to make sure that you get a notification when we go live every day. Let's take a look at what we just kind of recap some of the stuff we had today. So we had Matt Smith, our computing editor, in here in the beginning of the show, kind of running down what the big stories of the day were, that Samsung foldable phone. Uh, there's another leak, or not a leak, but I guess a teaser video that came out from Samsung about it. So we'll see what that means. Uh, we also talked about how Google is going to slowly be rolling out their AR feature for maps, which is really cool. So augmented reality feature for maps. I think it's cool, actually, Matt didn't. Let's, let's see what you think about it. Uh, we've got an article up at digitaltrends.com. You can take a look there. Of course, just watch back on this video. Then we had Kate Welch in to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, one of the writers for Dungeons and Dragons. So very exciting to have her on and find out about everything that she's working on and how they're incorporating apps into everything and, uh, and what that means going forward. And then Julian Tocatu, of course, our mobile editor in our New York studio. All right. Let's take a look at what's coming up on the docket for tomorrow. So just a little bit of a teaser because we're going back here live again tomorrow. We've got uh, Ronan Glan, our automotive editor. Of wherever he is in the world, he'll be joining us to talk about the latest in automotive, which is so much involved in tech right now. And then we're going to have uh, Jerry Colbert and Adam Davis from Atomic Entertainment are going to be joining us. So if you have questions for them, and I'm sure a lot of you do, get those in and we'll make sure to be able to ask those live. And again, broadcasting live, but also available afterward. All these videos go up and we have all the day's news at digitaltrends.com. So go there, keep up to date with everything that's going on, whatever you're interested in. We've got experts that are talking about that. We've got editors that are talking about that. However deep you want to go, we've got it there. If you just want to be catch up on what the, what the big news of the day is, also follow there as well. So follow us on Twitter, everywhere else. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, as I said at the beginning, Elon Musk will make room for you later this week. If you do want to join the show, just shoot us a message and, uh, and we'll get back to you on that. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more Digital Trends Live. Oh, 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 oh,